really apply across all the five sensory systems, uh, vision, uh, hearing, uh, touch, taste, and uh, smell. Uh, most, uh, well, all of these different senses have at their fundamental base sensory receptors. And sensory receptors are specialized neurons that, speci that detect a specific category of physical events in the environment. And they essentially transduce or convert an sensory energy from the external world into neural activity often in the form of slow uh, graded potentials or even action potentials. And only certain types of energy will activate a specific uh, type of sensory receptor. So we see with the visual system, this is just going to do this the whole class, I'm sure. Uh, with the visual system, uh, light or photic energy is first converted into chemical energy in the photoreceptors in the retina, and then that chemical energy is then converted to graded potentials uh, in the form of in producing neural activity. Um, in the auditory system, sound waves are converted to mechanical energy by um, uh, moved by vibrating the tympanic membrane, which is attached to um, little bones in the ear. And uh, the, the little bones of the ear move a uh, membrane in the cochlea called the basilar membrane. And uh, certain parts of the basilar membrane will vibrate or resonate at certain specific um, uh, frequencies. And so uh, at the point where uh, there, it's lined with the uh, little hair receptors, those are the sensory receptors in the auditory system, and after the receptor hair cells at a particular frequency are activated, a neural discharge occurs. The somatosensory system is fairly complex, and we have a lot of mechanical energy types of stimulation in the form of uh, touch, pressure, and vibration that activates mechanoreceptors in the skin, and that generates neural activity. Taste and olfaction work very similarly. Uh, here, molecules are carried in the air, and they fit into specific receptors that have the same shape as the uh, molecules in the air. And uh, when the uh, molecules bind to those receptors, it activates uh, relevant neural activity to give us the sensation of sour or bitter or um, sweet or things like that. And then pain, uh, there's usually tissue damage that's associated with pain. And uh, that releases a substance called neurokinin, which acts like a neurotransmitter to activate pain fibers. Um, the notion of a receptive field is very important. And each sensory receptor responds to a little part of the world uh, that is called the receptive field. And information is funneled or integrated from multiple uh, receptive fields to a ganglion cell through convergence. And uh, receptive fields will overlap for nearby sensory neurons, but each re uh, cell, each individual receptor responds to a discrete part of the world, and that's known as its receptive field. These neural relays that I mentioned um, are important because uh, each sensory system requires about three to four neurons connected in sequence to get the information from the activity in the receptor cell all the way back to the cerebral cortex. And two things can actually happen at synapses between neurons in the relay. First of all, some kind of motor response can be produced. And as an example, uh, axons from pain receptors first synapse in the spinal cord where they can produce a withdrawal reflex without having to actually uh, travel all the way up to the brain. It can, uh, this reflex action can happen very quickly um, if uh, somebody uh, grabs something that's hot, for example. Uh, that withdrawal reflex will produce a very quick motor response. Then the axons from those pain receptors then synapse in the brain stem where they can produce a whole limb or body movement so they withdraw from painful stimulus. So it's not just the reflex in one specific body part, but it's, it's actually a whole withdrawal of the entire body that is mediated through the, um, the, 
synapse in the um, brainstem. Then finally, these axons will synapse in the thalamus and uh, with uh, an interaction between the thalamus and cortical cells, they can actually produce future anticipation and or avoidance of the stimulus that could be potentially painful. So there are several different levels you see in this, um, uh, in, in this sensory system uh, associated with the pain receptor. Alternatively, uh, the code carrying the message from the outside world can actually be modified in a variety of ways. And uh, the code can be made more elaborate or precise, or descending impulses from the cortex can actually block or amplify the code. Um, and there has to typically be a change in the code from level to level in the sensory systems. This is an example of the um, uh, the arrangement of cells in the retina. And uh, light actually comes in this direction, so it actually passes through the ganglion cells in the retina uh, and the amacrine cells, the horizontal, uh, the bipolar cells, horizontal cells, and then finally gets to the photoreceptors at the very back of the eye. And we have these cone-shaped photoreceptors, which are called cones, and these rod-shaped uh, photoreceptors, which oddly enough are called rods. And uh, uh, so the light passes through all of these cells to uh, cause uh, a chemical reaction to occur, or chemical changes in the photoreceptors. These photoreceptors then stimulate um, some graded potentials in the uh, horizontal and bipolar cells. Uh, and uh, you'll see that several of these rods and cones kind of converge on uh, a single um, uh, uh, horizontal cell, and then the horizontal cell um, then further converges on a bipolar cell. Bipolar cells feed into amacrine cells before going on to ganglion cells. So by the time the stimulation from here to here uh, occurs, the, uh, this ganglion cell is taking in the activity of a number of photoreceptors simultaneously. Primarily the order, I think the order of uh, the cells would be good and uh, whether or not they produce graded potentials or action potentials. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about the photoreceptors. Uh, that's about the extent that I would, I would expect you to know. So um, it takes one or more cells to transduce or convert the outside physical energy into neural energy. And then once transduced, we see that all sensory information from any sensory system or sensory receptor will be coded by action potentials. And so the sensory information then enters the brain through bundles of axons. And remember, we call those bundles of axons outside the brain nerves. And uh, we call bundles of axons inside the brain, tra or the spinal cord, we call those tracts. So how does sensory information get coded in the, uh, in the brain? How do these sensory receptors operate to try to indicate whether we're looking at something green or something blue, whether something's uh, bright or dim? whether something's moving or still, whether we're looking at a mountain or a marketplace. So the presence of a stimulus can actually be coded by an increase or decrease in the discharge rate or the firing rate of a neuron. Remember last time we talked about the, uh, the rate law associated with um, uh, neurons. And so the, there, uh, an action potential either occurs or doesn't occur and uh, we're really looking at, uh, the, the neuron is, is uh, looking at whether the, that rate of generation of action potentials is fast or slow. Uh, it could actually also measure the amount of change from one point in time to the next, and the amount of change in activity or firing rate of a neuron could uh, also code intensity. Qualitative visual changes, like a change from red to green, can be coded by activity in different neurons or even by different levels of activity in the same neuron. 
such that maybe more activity would, uh, in the neuron would uh, be a code for a redder stimulus in the environment, less activity would be coding for a greener stimulus in the environment. So uh, it's really, again, governed by the rate law, and uh, uh, it's, again, very creative how neurons can act together to, uh, to try to code different sensory experiences across multiple sensory modalities. So how do we perceive the different sensations are different from each other? Why, how do we come to differentiate uh, visual stimuli from auditory stimuli and so forth, because ultimately um, the, uh, the same neural energy, the same action potentials are generated down the line in response to the environmental stimuli, be they visual stimuli or auditory stimuli. So um, the cortical areas that process the sensations like uh, visual or auditory stimulation are different. And so they fire differently, they, they activate different neural circuitry, which leads to a different experience of that uh, sensory event. And then we learn through experience to distinguish different senses. Um, and typically, our senses are kept relatively separate from each other, so a visual stimulus is exclusively visual, an auditory stimulus is uh, exclusively auditory, uh, and so forth. But uh, there are uh, individuals called synesthetes who experience synesthesia or mixed senses. And these are people in which um, a, uh, an auditory stimulus could evoke a, a, a color, for example. And so you might, a person might hear a, free, a tone or a note at a particular frequency and that gives them the sensation of, a, of blue. Uh, whereas another note might give them a sensation of, of indigo. Um, so uh, synesthesia is actually not as uncommon as we might think. Um, it used to be thought to be very, very rare, or very unusual, but uh, many people seem to have at least some degree of synesthesia. It's another example of somebody describing the number seven evoked um, a, uh, a color, the color blue, uh, kind of a, a sky blue, and the number eight evoked an indigo kind of um, sensory experience. And uh, sometimes people will experience even more uh, synesthesias across three or more senses, but that's, uh, that in particular is quite rare. Uh, in every sensory system, multiple pathways exist from the sensory receptor to the brain, and uh, the subsystems typically will have uh, various specialized functions we'll see that in some cases we'll, there are brainstem or um, subcortical areas that uh, are responsible for vision, and there are also cortical areas that are responsible for vision. And so there's sort of a uh, more of a subcortical and cortical control of vision that uh, operates maybe simultaneously. What's interesting is the subcortical pathway mm -hmm. Is, um, uh, is associated with non-conscious visual processing. And so people can actually not be conscious of seeing, they're, they're seeing without seeing, essentially. And we'll see in some examples of this uh, phenomenon called blind sight in a little bit. Uh, the visual system, for example, is made up of many subsystems and uh, we, uh, probably know the most about the visual system compared to any other sensory system, but pattern perception has certain subsystems or networks, color perception, same uh, depth perception, and visual tracking. And these subsystems within the broad domain of the visual system are as independent from each other as uh, hearing is from taste, for example. And also, just because certain um, regions associated with these uh, sis, uh, subsystems are in close anatomical proximity, that doesn't mean that they're functionally identical, uh, identical or interchangeable. So we'll see that uh, the, the striate cortex or primary visual cortex uh, 
is one of the regions where uh, a lot of important processing takes place. Some of those regions process movement, some of those process form, some of those regions process color. And so um, just because they're, uh, they're all very close to each other, that doesn't mean uh, that uh, uh, the regions associated with form are functionally identical or interchangeable with the regions associated with color. So launching into the visual system, it's important to distinguish between sensation and perception. Um, the sensation is really the, um, when the cells of the nervous system detect stimuli in the environment. Just uh, activity of the cells that are taking in external energy, physical energy from the environment and becoming active, and that's sensation. Perception involves a conscious experience and uh, the ability to interpret, to interpret information from the senses. So perception is kind of a higher order uh, type of process compared to simple sensation. Uh, sensation is much, uh, much simpler than, uh, than perception uh, because perception involves that, that notion of a conscious experience. Within the visual system, we can experience um, uh, several perceptual dimensions of color um, and that color <coughs> uh, can be categorized along three different um, uh, types. We have the hue, which corresponds to the dominant wavelength of the color that we're looking at. And then we have brightness and saturation. Brightness corresponds to the intensity. And you can see that uh, this is decreasing brightness all the way up to increasing brightness. Uh, so the intensity um, uh, of that stimulus uh, increases as we go vertically. And the saturation refers to the purity of the color that we're looking at. And so as saturation increases, the color becomes much more defined. Uh, the visible part of our spectrum that our eye can tune into accounts for about 1 70th of the entire range of the electromagnetic system, uh, or spectrum rather. And so we have gamma rays, for example, down at the lower end of the spectrum. Uh, up here we have uh, uh, AC circuits, television and radio broadcast frequencies, uh, radar, infrared rays, and so forth. So uh, um, our eyes are tuned into this uh, electromagnetic um, energy in the uh, environment in a very small segment of the entire spectrum. So it, when uh, light comes into the eye, it's bent by the cornea and the lens and focused on receptors at the back of the eye. Uh, and as I mentioned, light travels through the outer layers of the retina to strike photoreceptors um, that uh, lie on the inner surface of the retina. Uh, it's going through those outer layers, the ganglion cells, the bipolar cells, and so forth to reach the photoreceptors. And then within the photoreceptors, we have chemical reactions that are induced by light that occur at the distal end of the receptor, and they produce um, electrical potentials. And I always wondered how, if, if, if the action is taking place first at the photoreceptors, yet the light has to go through all these cells to get to them, how does that happen? Well, it turns out that the retinal cells, like the ganglion cells and bipolar cells and so forth, they're transparent. And so uh, the photoreceptors are extremely sensitive as well. So it's very easy for the light to pass through to activate the photoreceptors so that they can do their thing. So the photoreceptors I alluded to briefly before, we have rods and cones. And the rods are far more numerous. Uh, we have about 120 million rods compared to only about 6 million cones in the eye. And rods are associated with having very large receptive fields. The uh, rods, each rod has, takes care of a large part of the world compared to the cone, which um, attends to a very small part of the world. Um, the rods are very sensitive to dim light, and our, it's our rods that are active mainly at night. And when, we're, when the lights are dim, for example, uh, our rods are uh, 
uh, uh, enabling us to see in dim light. Um, there's very few, if any, rods in the fovea um, of the eye, uh, and uh, many rods share a single ganglion cell. So there are many rods that then converge down to a single ganglion cell. Um, the cones are better in bright light, bless you, and uh, they're uh, better for transducing bright light and usually used uh, during daytime vision and especially for color vision. Uh, cones are responsive to uh, wavelengths producing hues of uh, red, blue, and green, and various combinations of red, blue, and green enable us to see colors other than just red, blue, or green. Uh, the cones are tightly packed in the foveal region at the back of the retina, and uh, one or a few cones are connected to each ganglion cell in the fovea, and that accounts for the better visual acuity in the fovea compared to our visual acuity for things in the per our peripheral vision, uh, which is much less, uh, our, our visual acuity is much less for things on the, on the periphery. And this is an example showing the uh, passage of light through the ganglion cell, bipolar cell, photoreceptor. Um, interestingly, when stimulated by light, uh, the rods and cones hyperpolarize instead of depolarize. And that's a little bit different from other cells that we've been talking about. Um, so uh, when there's a, a lot of light uh, that the rods and cones are exposed to, they hyperpolarize as opposed to depolarize. And so when they're in a depolarized state, there's a continuous release of neurotransmitter uh, glutamate, in this case, in the dark, and uh, less release of the neurotransmitter occurs uh, in the light. And uh, whenever the neurotransmitter uh, is reduced uh, by uh, uh, increased uh, light, that causes the cell to depolarize, and uh, then uh, the, uh, it, it induces graded potentials uh, in the photoreceptor uh, and uh, causes the uh, bipolar cell to uh, start to release more neurotransmitter and that in turn excites the ganglion cell. And so uh, the depolarization ultimately causes a, a bipolar cell in the middle between the photoreceptor and the ganglion cell to release more neurotransmitter and that uh, again excites the ganglion cell. The amount of neurotransmitter that's released is um, related to the size of the receptor potential and a continuous flow of glutamate, uh, the neurotransmitter involved, is uh, released in darkness which inhibits the bipolar cell activity. There are certain kinds of pigments in rods and cones that are different. Um, we have the, the photopigment in the rod that's called rhodopsin. Uh, some people pronounce it rhodopsin, which makes sense because it's in the rod. Uh, but rhodopsin is more sensitive to light than the uh, corresponding photopigments in the cones. So very, very sensitive to light. In fact, you can see a lighted match at about two miles uh, thanks to the sensitivity of our rods. Rhodopsin remains broken down in very bright light, so rods um, uh, barely function in bright light, and that's when the cones take over in bright light. The time required to adjust to dark light uh, is uh, when we go into a movie theater or something like that is due to the time required for the rhodopsin to kind of resynthesize and, and uh, become active again. There is only one type of rhodopsin, and that rhodopsin just responds to light and dark. In the cones, we have iodopsin, and there are actually three different varieties located in different cones. And these varieties of iodopsin respond differently to different wavelengths of light and enable our um, color vision. Uh, the iodopsin doesn't function at all in dim light, so that's why it's very difficult to perceive colors in the dark. Uh, and it also, uh, this iodopsin requires a high level of light intensity for it to function. So it really needs a lot of light for it to kind of turn on.
So those are the, the principal photopigments that we find in rods and cones, rhodopsin in the rods and iodopsin in the cones. And this is, again, just a cartoon that I showed you earlier of the ganglion cell layer. Um, and the ganglion cells are connected to the bipolar cells via amacrine cells. And then the bipolar cells and the photoreceptors are connected via the horizontal cells. And uh, then we have the photoreceptors at the very back of the eye. <coughs> And that's just another uh, simpler diagram just showing you the order. So the photoreceptors, the rods and cones are connected to simple cells called bipolar cells uh, in which receptor cells, the photoreceptor cells, induce graded potentials in the bipolar cells. So they're not uh, uh, depolarizing or uh, the uh, cell or um, they're uh, simply inducing smaller uh, sub-threshold graded potentials. They're too small individually to fire an action potential. But collectively, when there's a lot of graded potentials coming in, that can then stimulate um, uh, the cells down the line, uh, the ganglion cells, to produce uh, action potentials. So the bipolar cells themselves only produce graded potentials, uh, and uh, those graded potentials summate or add together, and if they can bring the membrane um, of the bipolar cells to a certain uh, uh, super-threshold level, then that will induce an action potential from the ganglion cells. And the, as I mentioned, the horizontal cells connect the rods and cones to the bipolar cells. Amacrine cells connect the bipolar cells to the ganglion. The ganglion cells actually send their axons into the brain. So the retina has multiple levels. These levels sort of correspond to the different cells uh, involved in the, uh, in the circuitry. So I mentioned the fovea where the, we have the densest concentration of cones and uh, it's very important for the eye itself to maintain an image of whatever it's looking at on the fovea to enhance the acuity of what's being perceived. And uh, to do that, there are very characteristic eye movements that uh, the eye makes and uh, these eye movements are very important to evaluate because if there's a problem with any of these kinds of movements, it could signal some, uh, something that needs to be taken care of. And uh, from a neuropsychologist's point of view, very important because it can account for visual problems during uh, cognitive testing, for example. So the vergence movement is a cooperative movement of the eyes which ensures that the image of an object falls on identical parts of both retinas uh, and that enables depth perception. And so uh, vergence would be sort of taking an image of my, looking at my finger as I bring it closer and closer to my nose, my eyes are starting to turn in so that it keeps that, that image of the finger on the same part of the retina in both eyes. Uh, it allows me to, to see that the finger is closer than, the, than everybody in the class, that you're beyond that finger and, uh, and, and, and deeper. Um, now, uh, disorders of virgin's movement, uh, there's a condition called strabismus uh, or uh, amblyopia uh, or lazy eye, uh, colloquially that uh, where one eye sort of deviates off and it, it um, can affect the person's uh, depth perception. So uh, oftentimes that might be corrected by um, uh, various methods, uh, but uh, early on, uh, hopefully it's identified early on so children can be corrected for, uh, uh, for that uh, disorder and virgin's movement. Saccadic movement uh, is rapid jerky movement of the eyes used in scanning a visual scene or in reading, for example. And uh, <coughs> disorders of uh, saccadic movement can often be seen in a lot of neurological conditions. Uh, one of those is something called progressive supranuclear palsy. And uh, people have uh, slowed uh, volitional saccades uh, 
uh, where they try to look up um, or try to follow an object up um, in the vertical plane uh, and uh, they have more of a problem looking down. And so uh, with uh, progressive nuclear palsy, it's uh, again a disorder of, be of downward gaze where uh, they can't actually move their eyes down. Uh, it's a degenerative, uh, very de uh, difficult degenerative condition uh, and uh, that's it's certainly a, a serious type of condition. Uh, cerebellar degeneration produces the same type of difficulty with slowed volitional saccades uh, in the horizontal plane, so looking from side to side. Uh, disorders of the pons uh, can also produce problems with saccades. Um, Huntington's disease, an inherited movement disorder that uh, is um, autosomal dominant, we'll talk about that when we talk more about movement disorders. Uh, Wilson's disease is a disease associated with copper metabolism in which people uh, can, they have a characteristic uh, ring around their iris called a Kaiser Fleischer ring. And uh, this, represent, this ring represents um, a, a copper deposition in the eye. And so uh, after dietary efforts to try to reduce the amount of copper that's uh, taken in is important to treat that disorder. Uh, Whipple's disease is a relatively rare disease, but it's a, an infectious disease. Um, it's caused by a bacterial infection, and it, uh, it causes uh, a lot of fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, and uh, severe arthritis. And uh, usually it has to be treated with an antibiotic being given uh, not just for 10 days, but for actually a year. And if you treat it under a year, I think the, the the improvement rate goes down to only about 40%. So. But uh, fortunately, it's rare. Um, faster saccades uh, can be seen in myasthenia gravis, um, which is, uh, we've talked a little bit about that. There was a case study in your textbook, uh, a neuromuscular disease uh, that uh, involves a deficit of the acetylcholinergic uh, nicotinic receptor. And then the uh, third major eye movement is called pursuit movement, and that's the movement of the eyes to maintain an uh, image of a moving object on the, on the fovea. Uh, so again, following an object in the environment from one side to the other is called a pursuit movement. So uh, we've talked about the retina quite a bit because it is pretty complicated. Um, and uh, then axons of ganglion cells leave the retina to form the optic nerve, which then leaves the eye. And before the optic nerve enters the brain, the optic nerves partly cross, forming what's known as the optic chiasm. And half of the fibers of each eye cross <coughs> so that in each visual half field uh, is represented in the opposite side of the brain. And the retina itself can be divided into two half fields, the nasal side, or the, the half of the retina that's closest to the nose, and then the temporal <laughs> side, the half of the retina that's closest to the temples on the outside. So we, we can refer to the nasal uh, retina or the temporal retina uh, using that convention. And so, uh, um, for example, uh, anything in the right visual field to the individual's right, this fish, for example, is projected to the temporal uh, half of the retina in the left eye and uh, to the um, nasal half of the retina in the right eye. And then you can trace the pathway of this color, I think it's red, coming back. Uh, you see that here there's the optic chiasm, or uh, some of the fibers from the left eye go ipsilaterally, and uh, the uh, fibers from the other half of the left eye uh, go contralaterally to the other side of the brain, to the upper hemisphere. And then uh, once it passes the optic chiasm, it's transmitted to the lateral geniculate nucleus and the thalamus. This is the thalamus here. And then through several optic radiations, it progresses back to striate cortex or primary visual cortex, and then sent on to surrounding visual association uh, cortex uh, or extra striate cortex. 
And so what we, uh, what is the image that our brain is actually seeing is upside down and backwards. So the optic nerves are nothing more than axons of the retinal ganglion cells, um, and they're bundled together to form the optic nerve, um, and it's not a tract yet because it's still outside the brain. Once it goes inside the brain, then we have a tract. Uh, the optic nerves convey information to the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN, after crossing the optic chiasm, as I mentioned. And uh, this uh, uh, pathway from the LGN back to the primary visual cortex is what we call the mammalian visual system. It's associated with conscious visual perception. Um, there's also a pathway that goes to the superior colliculi directly and bypasses the dorsolateral geniculate nucleus. And that's pretty cool because when it goes directly back to the superior colliculi, uh, that's our primitive visual sy system and that's responsible for unconscious visual perception, that, that visual pathway that's being used in blind sight. Um, as you'll recall, the superior colliculi are associated with the visual system the inferior colliculi are associated with the auditory system. And both of these, they're collectively called the corpora quadrigemina, or four bodies, um, and uh, they are responsible for our orienting to um, uh, rapid uh, visual stimuli in the environment or, um, or sudden uh, auditory stimuli. So uh, if there's a, somebody takes a picture of me over there with a flash and I, I would turn my head, that's uh, being generated by uh, the superior colliculi to, to orient myself to see what, what's going on. Um, same thing with uh, if there's a loud explosion or something that occurs or a scratching sound that occurs down here, um, you know, it causes, causes me to orient toward that to check it out, and that's the action of the, the corporate quadrigemina. So to talk a little bit about blind sight, uh, again, as I mentioned, from the uh, optic nerve, we have projections to the uh, uh, mammalian visual system uh, through the LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and onto the striate and extra striate cortex. And uh, this mammalian visual system is associated with speech and thinking and words, uh, as well as conscious experience of whatever we're, we're seeing. And uh, there are other complex behaviors that it's associated with. Uh, damage actually abolishes perception and awareness of visual stimuli. Remember, perception involves that, uh, that conscious uh, uh, perception and uh, I actually, one of the very first patients that I ever saw had this type of thing going on. Uh, he was, a lot of people wondered if he could actually see and if he was faking his deficit. And he sure enough had a stroke. He was blind. Uh, he, the stroke affected his occipital cortex. So he, he was not aware of being able to see and yet he was exhibiting uh, different features of being able to see. And, uh, we uh, finally determined that it, uh, he was uh, somebody who was exhibiting this blind sight. So the blind sight, uh, the, uh, again, the same information from the eye is being passed to the primitive visual system, and a person isn't aware of the visual information that's received in the primitive visual system. Um, so these primitive behavioral mechanisms include eye and head movements, as I mentioned, the orienting movements, reaching movements out with the hands and other simple behaviors. You might have even experienced blind sight if you um, are in a dark environment that's relatively familiar uh, to you. And uh, sometimes in the dark, you, uh, when it's pitch black, you might be able, you might surprise yourself at being able to reach out and for a glass or, or uh, something that's on the, on the counter. And uh, I've experienced that myself and um, I'm, uh, pretty confident that uh, has to be mediated through something like blind sight. Um, I mean, there's, it's not you know, totally, totally dark, but uh, it's dark enough where your uh, mammalian visual system may, may not be kicking in. 
So the ph phenomenon of blindsight suggests that the visual information can control behavior without producing a conscious sensation. And that tells us that consciousness itself is not a general property of our brain. That we can be processing things and doing things that we're totally unconscious of, which is kind of interesting. Some parts, but not others, play a role in our consciousness. Like, I'm not generally conscious of feeling the floor uh, against my feet, but if I focus on it, I am. Um, you know, right now I'm, now I'm conscious of it, but in a few minutes when I forget about it, I'm not going to be conscious of that, that sensation, yet that sensation is there. So perceptions don't need to uh, enter consciousness to actually exert an effect on behavior. Now I'll play you a little clip of somebody